Welcome, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event organized by the Amsterdam Research Center for Gender and Sexuality, ArcGS, um, which is a part of the Amsterdam Institute for Social uh, Science Research. My name is Sara Bracke, and I hold the chair in sociology of gender and sexuality at the University of Amsterdam, and I direct the Amsterdam Research Center for Gender and Sexuality together with Julie McBrien, who is, who is here as well. Um, RGS is a research community, so we seek to bring together scholars and scholarship on gender and or sexuality within the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research. Now, this is a community shaped by many differences in disciplinary context, in disciplinary traditions, different theoretical and epistemological approaches, different methodologies, and also differences in the emphasis on gender or sexuality within one's research. And we are committed um, to bringing these differences together in fruitful ways, enabling new ways of thinking. We currently have two different lecture, sometimes by now uh, real life lectures and sometimes uh, still webinars. So two different lecture or webinar series. One is called Thinking Through the Crises and engages with different kinds of contemporary crises that we are faced with, exploring the gendered and the sexuality angle of these crises. And the second one is called Research in Focus, and that focuses on a new exciting research that has just come out. And of course, there's an overlap between these two series. Um, check out our website, also our very active PhD community, and join the newsletter uh, to stay connected to our activities. So today we have our first research in focus uh, event of 2022. And I think this is the sixth edition of uh, research in focus since uh, September 2020. And it's a great pleasure to devote this session to the presentation of a book that just came out well, in this very month, right? Like two or three weeks ago. Um, and that is the book entitled The Flexibility Paradox, Why Flexible Working Conditions Lead to Self-Exploitation, written by He Yung Chung and published by, well, Bristol University Press, Polity Press, well, yeah, both. Um, and um, so that is the book that is central today, and Professor Chung has kindly agreed to present the book today, and also to speak in particular about the gendered dimensions of flexible working conditions in a presentation entitled, Why Flexible Working is Not a Magic Bullet for Enhancing Gender Equality. So let me now briefly introduce the speakers of today. Hyung Chung is Professor of Sociology and Social Policy at the School of Social Policy, Sociology and Social Research at the University of Kent. And she is a comparative labor market researcher interested in how working conditions influence workers' well-being, work-life balance and gender equality. And she was the principal investigator of the UK Research Council funded project called Work Autonomy, Flexibility and Work-Life Balance. And so now this month, she has published the book, The Flexibility um, Paradox, about which we will hear more today. Welcome, Hee-Yung, and congratulations on the book. And Professor Chung will be joining conversation by two speakers who are very close, very dear to the RGS community. Stephanie Steinmetz, who is a board member of RGS and is Associate Professor of Social Stratification at the University of Lausanne and Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on vulnerabilities in the labor market from an intersectional and across national perspective. And let me also say that Stephanie just received the news that her new research project on improving female migrant labor market positioning in Europe has been awarded with an ERC consolidator grant. So also congratulations, Stephanie. And then there is Dragana Stoimenowska, who is a long time ago won the master thesis prize of our GS for the best uh, master thesis in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, right? And who since then has also been the coordinator of the RGS PhD club. Uh, Dragana is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of the Sociology uh, of New York University of NYU, specializing in the study of gender and work. 
She holds an NVO, that is the Dutch Research Council um, grant, a Rubicon grant entitled The Stalled Narrowing of the Gender Pay Gap, Overwork and Gender Task Segregation. And let me also add that she was just awarded her PhD title last Friday, kind of about this time, right, <laughs> for an outstanding doctoral thesis on the gendered distribution of workplace authority. The thesis entitled Men's Place, the Incomplete Integration of Women in Workplace Authority. So with these amazing speakers, these very distinguished guests, um, this is what we will do today. First, he Jung will present uh, the book that is the central focus of today. And then first Stephanie and then Dragana will start asking their questions and, and begin conversation. Um, and at some point, I will also invite uh, the audience in. In the meantime, um, you, the audience, you can type in your questions in the Q&A box. You can do that throughout. Um, and so at some point we will be looking at these questions and adding them to the conversation that was already begun. And that's all from me today. And so Hijung, it's a pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you, Zara. And thank you also for everyone for coming, but also I'm so looking forward to this talk because Dragana and Stephanie just, I, I, well, first of all, congratulations. We didn't, I didn't know about these amazing feats, but, you know, I'm so excited to also hear your thoughts on, on the contents of today. So, um, yeah, so as, as can everybody see this? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and as Sarah said, this is going to be a talk around my book, which just came out of, uh, now we calculated about three weeks ago, uh, about the flexibility paradox. So initially the book, I was, it, it's kind of interesting because the book is based on the research I carried out perhaps in the past 10, 15 years, uh, a large chunk of which was uh, awarded by the ESRC, uh, Economic Social Research Council in the UK. And so, and I, I've, I've taken ages, like two, three years to write it. But having said that, while giving talks, you know, in different places, I realize, you know, I'm only like making sense of a lot of it now. And especially today's talk, I'm really excited to, to do because I realize how much of this book is really about genders. It's really, it was never necessarily the goal of it, but while writing it, while kind of digesting and chewing on it, which I'm even doing now, I, I really realize how much of this is really about issues around the exploitation of women essentially in modern day society and how flexible working essentially is a real enabler <laughs> of doing that without us seriously disrupting ideas around work, division of labor and, and well-being issues. So, just to kind of start, one of the first first starting points I wanted to start off with, because you know you have to have a question, a research, or, or some sort of an issue problem uh, area, and as many of you know, and not necessarily always, but it's it's still like across the world, flexible working has been kind of introduced as some sort of kind of an amazing easy way to tackle a lot of the gender equality problems that across the world. And then again, this has been shown like in the UK where. You know, the right to request flexible working has been introduced in 2003 and expanded very quickly over the past decade. And Theresa May actually talks about how the gender pay gap is a problem, and one of the main ways of tackling it was to introduce flexible working. Uh, similar kind of debates have been ongoing in, in the Netherlands, as many of you know, and the European Commission most recently introduced flexible working as a part of their kind of work-life balance directive, again, with the idea of enabling better work-life balance for working parents, but also really kind of crucial to that, the, the idea that this is going to be a great way to tackle gender equality. Um, <clears throat> what, I, what I will say is that that's true. That is actually true, but there's a huge but behind it. So it's just, yes, it's, it's, it's an incredible enabler. It enables not only women, but those with care responsibilities and any other responsibilities outside of work to better engage with the labor market. However, it is just the introduction of flexible working isn't going to cut it, is essentially what I'm going to say in this talk. So again, this is the book, and the just to give you kind of the, a brief definition of what I meant by flexibility paradox is that when workers gain, there's it's a, it's a paradox because you assume that when workers gain more freedom and control over their work, that you would assume that they will expand leisure, expand their kind of private time, 
because you know if you think about it in the rational choice theory if you want that if you were given the choice why would they work more they would just slack off and that is kind of still in the kind of psych uh, the ideas or <laughs> our norms around flex working but actually when workers gain more control more uh, more more freedom over when and where they can work, such as through flexi time, working time autonomy or home working, they end up working harder and longer. And I, I really like this definition by Anne Grunland is that the highly praised freedom of modern flexible working is a bit of a honey trap. It's tempting sweet, but also sticky trap enabling workers to work longer. And I guess the key thing is about what is work and how work really is defined differently because of our social normative views about what men and women should do. Just a big kind of uh, 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 limitation. So in this talk and in the book, um, you know, gender cuts across a wide range of spectrums, but in the talk, I am kind of talking about men and women, which is, doesn't actually represent all the gender identities that exist uh, uh, in, in our current day society. And a lot of the, 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 the uh, data, as well as what I would talk about, is very heteronormative. But I, I do think it's really important that we acknowledge and, and really focus on a lot of uh, homo, homosexual, but also, uh, also diverse kind of family uh, forms as well as single families, as well as single parent families, uh, which I I don't do too much into, although it does reflect, I mean, there's a lot of the results is applicable to a wide range of, of workers, but just wanted to say that um, before I could move on. So what I'm going to talk about today is first, I'm going to talk a bit more about what that flexibility paradox or why that flexibility paradox happens. I'm going to really breeze through the empirical analysis results because I'm just assuming that you will trust me when I say this happens. And then I uh, will uh, really focus more on that gender flexibility paradox. And again, the exploitation model, which is the first thing that I've mentioned to you in this talk and how then it relates to kind of gender stigma, uh, flexibility stigma, and then perhaps kind of go into this, what can we do about this <laughs> issue? And this is kind of the content of the book, which I just wanted to show you that there's a lot of other things in the book, but what I'm really focusing is on chapter five, seven, and eight, uh, which is kind of the main, let's say, the crux of, of, of the book anyways. Um, just to clarify what I mean by flexible work, and flexible working can mean a whole range of things, including like part-time work or phased retirement, etc. But what I'm talking really about is when workers have the control to kind of change their schedules, the work schedule, so it's change the starting and ending times of work. Um, such as with flexi time, but working time autonomy provides even more flexibility. So that's that you could even change the number of days you work, et cetera, or, or hours you work, in addition to changing the starting and ending times of work. And the, the third thing is teleworking. So it's essentially not having to go into the office or your workspace every day to work, that you could work outside your office. And this is especially teleworking during the normal hours. And it's not about working additional hours at home, but you know, being able to work from home during the, your normal working hours. <clears throat> um, this is just to give you an idea of how much of that kind of flexible working exists in Europe, which, you know, again, a lot of my work is based on quantitative research, although it also draws from a lot of qualitative work, which is based on interviews and, 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 and engagements I had with not only just workers, but also uh, uh, employers. Um, so this is a so flexible schedule. So about quarter of all EU um, kind of workers have some sort of you know, flexibility in their schedules. About one out of five work teleworked, a bit less work from home. So what is the, the theory of per flexibility paradox? So essentially, okay, so, and this is something that you see in academia as well. And this is, you know, I, I, I found writing this book very uh, reflective process because when I was writing this book, it was, I did feel like a lot of it was autobiography, uh, autoethnography actually, because if you think about academics and, and, and there was still like a bit of a myth about, oh yeah, academics, you have all the summer off, like, and you have all this freedom and you only teach how many, like, School teachers teach how many six hours, six, seven hours a day, but you guys only do like how many six hours a week. And then like, you must have loads of time. 
if you look at surveys of cross uh, higher educated workers or, or, or university workers, so you see that academics have one of the worst working conditions ever. Like we're, we're probably similar to bankers and you know people who work in Goldman Sachs. As well as we have this horrible working culture where there is especially a lot of leading kind of senior academics, you know, talk about, oh yeah, if you don't put 70 hours a week in, you're not a serious academic. And there's a huge thing about that. And ironically, we are one of the you know, occupations with the most flexibility in our jobs in terms of when we work and where we work with the exception of teaching hours, perhaps. So, if you look at other studies such as Kelly and Anderson, why do people with the most freedom over their work work longer and harder? They talk about three theories. One is the imposed intensification. Essentially that employers let you work flexibly so that they could add more work in, which actually you see in academia so that you are flexible. So you don't really have overtime so that we could just add more coursework on you because you can't really distinguish kind of when is your working hours and when it isn't. The social exchange theory is that, oh, because my employer gave me the gift of flexibility, I will give you back, especially if you think about those who don't need to commute and especially people, for example, in the UK, going into London takes about like two, three hours a day to commute. So if you're gonna be saving three hours by not commuting, that you're kind of giving back a part of that to your employer. And also because, you know, as I showed you, flexible working despite you know, the pandemic has changed it, but it wasn't still something that was used across the board. So it's kind of like, it was a special gift that I got. So I don't want to lose it. So I'm going to make sure that I don't lose it by working harder and longer. Enabled intensification is the idea that if you let people work from home or if you let people work kind of like the schedules that they want to, that they are likely to perform their best work because, you know, they could choose, pick and choose the right timing for their work. And also when you work from home, you have less uh, um, <clears throat> distraction. So you are able to work harder, essentially. And also, you know, because you don't have to commute, you feel less fatigued. So it reduces absenteeism and sickness. <clears throat> kind of related to that and not necessarily only related to that enabled intensification myth, but maybe kind of the mixture of the three. Um, there have been uh, uh, scholars such as Putnam, Asmania, Netho, Pankras, and Vots who talks about self-exploitation, that flexible working leads to longer and harder working because it is used by workers to enhance their competitive and this is kind of, again, looking, you know, at, at academics, but also other occupations with that similar level of flexibility and how it is used. So what Masmanian et al. talks about is that a lot of this flexible working has also been introduced in the context of or with the, uh, the kind of push of long working hours culture where to maintain a certain kind of professional reputation that you had to work long hours or you have to perform this, you know, very always being on kind of a, 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 this performance, which results in an increased kind of vicious cycle of competition across the workers where everybody's working harder and longer because there's no more strict boundaries of where work starts and where private or you know, private time begins. So rather than, it being a way in which people can expand their leisure time that when the boundaries are blurred in terms of temporal boundaries as well as physical boundaries, work increases because you're just, you know, you're just competing against each other. And because you know, if someone else does it, you also do it. And it, it enhances that kind of increased competition. Congress and Voss also talks about that is also induced by the fact that at the organizational level, companies are actually introducing mechanisms to make sure that workers compete against each other, such as performance related pay. And that is really important to understand when we think about, so when the kind of one of the limitations of previous scholars, I think was to try to limit this to certain occupations through certain Professions, which is what Masmanian and Putnam does, or, and et al. does, or that it only kind of limits to a certain kind of groups of companies, which Congress and Voss does. And what I'm trying to say is actually it is across the board. The reason for which is because 
we are currently living in a society where there has been the demise of the collective bargaining power. So workers' power, uh, bargaining power, individual and collective bargaining power has declined quite significantly over the past kind of two, three decades. There has been a real significant de demise of the welfare state, even in the most general welfare states where there has, you know, ideas of the job guarantee, especially public ser uh, employment service has, has declined as well as income protection, that there is no longer this guaranteed income Income protection for lots of workers in, in, in a lot of welfare states, which has then led to a rise in both employment and income insecurity for workers. With that comes this idea of individualization of risks. So in the previous welfare state, and you know, I am a welfare state scholar, and you know, one of the previous things that the previous welfare state, especially the golden era of the welfare state, did was that these ideas of risk were considered social risks. So people were pro provided protection. Whereas now, and this comes from the ideas of warfare, but also if you look, this kind of evidence comes from when we look at, you know, not across all countries, but especially in the neoliberal Anglo Saxon countries, the ideas of how we perceive unemployment, whose responsibility it is, but also at this, on the same token, how we perceive meritocracy, how we assume that there is meritocracy in, in the society. And on the same, you know, the same side of that, the opposite side of that coin is that when you are unemployed, that it is your own fault, that there has been an individualization of risk where individuals have to, or assume to inter, need to enterprise themselves as entrepreneurs where you are the master of your own destiny. And it is up to you to make sure that you are marketable, you are employable, and again, due to a whole range of these contexts. And this ties in very nicely with ideas of Foucault's homo economicus. Foucault's homo economicus is, how, is understanding how every individual interaction we have now in our current day society, well, this was 1970s society, so, you know, um, is, is now defined as market values and market exchange. So the enterprising of oneself is he understands it as the very in the very fabric of our societies and every interaction needs to be done in this market exchange value and in that context when this idea of neoliberalism and internalized capitalism managers no longer need to control workers and that freedom over your work actually is a much better way of not having to adhere to the labor laws that exist that are based on kind of old fashioned kind of industrial times. And actually it's a much easier way to exploit workers and make workers work harder and longer without the previous kind of ways of managing workers such as through Taylorism. I wanted to share this, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, what is it oh, like? picture. So it's about what internalized capitalism looks like. And this is kind of some of the things that you'll see even within yourselves, even those of us who might be very much into kind of resisting capitalism or anti-capitalist ideas that these kind of ideas of self and productivity are so embedded in us. And this is the context in which in that context, freedom over your work isn't necessarily going to lead to positive outcomes for your work and well-being. What is more, we, you know, kind of, or, or is it a manifestation or is it just a kind of an outcome or is it, it's that nowadays we, the way we value our self-worth as well as way we value other people's worth is about the busyness, busyness at work. So it's, it's, a, it's a badge of honor. You have to be busy. Otherwise you are not, a, you know, a member of society that contributes too much and that work has to be your passion. And this is just, Example. So, and I find this using, you know, longitudinal data, cross-sectional data, qualitative data, you know, and, and I'm not going to go into it because uh, what I want to say is, so, you know, flexible working leads to overtime, unpaid overtime, et cetera. One of the things that we do see is that there are gender differences. So what are the gender differences? One is that, for example, using German data, and this is a German social economic panel, that on average men increase their overtime by two hours when going from fixed schedules to working time autonomy. Women only do it by an hour. So it's like, oh, okay, so women don't self-exploit them as much. So that, that's what you could say, but it's because as you know, drawing from Fraser, this is the inadequacy of androcentric definitions. 
So if you look again back at Foucault, one of the things that he talks about is the enterprising of self does not only stop at yourself. The, the enterprising happens at the family level. What that means is family relationship, the parent-child relationship, especially the mother-child relationship, is also characterized by in terms of investment and profit. And in this case, the mother's investment is in time, the time and energy and an affection that she puts into a child is you has to be done because of the human capital potential of the child to be developed and be competitive in future labor markets. So, and this again, ties in nicely with what happened during the 1990s onwards, again, not across all countries, but I think increasingly we're seeing across all countries is the idea of intensive parenting. That there has been this whole idea of brain development of infants and children that women, especially, you know, parents, but you know, it's really women because of our gender normative views about who should be caring and who should be responsible for their child's well-being and future uh, labor market potential, that you have to, as a mother, you have to do a lot of enrichment, you know, interactive care with your child. Otherwise, you know, you are ruining that child's future. So you have to, you know, little Johnny's, um, you know, playtime has to be organized in a certain way. They have to do a certain enrichment activity after school activities. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're completely, you know, almost neglecting your child, right? That's the kind of culture that we're seeing since the 1990s. This is where, you know, the millennial generation. And to the point where, and this is from Dotisania Centres' work, uh, where full-time working mothers now spend more time compared to, or double the amount of time as, as 1960s housewives are, especially in this enrichment parenting. And this is especially a case with higher educated mothers. Um, and again, this is a whole range of, so what you see, okay, well, sorry, what you see then is that flexible working then, what, so doesn't necessarily lead to more overtime hours for women and mothers, but what it does is it increases housework and childcare hours mothers carry out. Now, fathers do not do that. So fathers will increase their overtime more, but mothers increase their overtime by an hour, but they also increase a whole heck of a lot of, of childcare hours. So for example, uh, Yvonne Lott, who's my, you know, one uh, my like my uh, the, a great co-author who has amazing work. She looks at GSEP again to show that mothers increase their childcare hours by three hours and then do an hour overtime when they work from home. <laughs> so they're like increasing hours, and it's work. Obviously, it's work. Care work is absolutely work. It's social has social value, etc. It's just that it's not captured in the labor market working hours data. And this is where kind of, this is kind of one of the main thing I want to say. And this is kind of leads us to the idea of the exploitation model, which has been mentioned. And again, I, I love how, I, first of all, I just want to do a shout out to all the old, you know, the previous generation feminists, because, you know, a lot of the work that we're carrying out, a lot of our 1980s, 70s feminists onwards have been saying over and over again, and we're still here, we're doing the same old shit. Um, but so, and this has been said by, you know, 1980s, uh, oh, I forgot their names, and then uh, uh, Sullivan and Lewis in 2001, again, 20 years ago, is that flexible working perpetuates the exploitation of women. How? Because on one hand, and I said it, again, it's, it's a great enabler, women were limited in taking part in the labor market because of this very fixed nature and being able to work from home, have flexible schedule, really enabled mothers to take part in the labor market in much better you know, ways than previous times. And I, I've, I have shown that in, in my studies as well. And it increases their possibility of staying in the labor market by double even. But it didn't, it, we did that by without changing the norm about the worker. We haven't really shifted the labor market and the shape of the labor market sufficiently, which is based on this one male, male, winner, the male breadwinner model, where you assume that you have a carer and you know, someone who's doing all the reproductive work for you at home. So we're still based on, and even we talk about, Kozer talk about the greed of so actually firms want more and more. And as I said, with flexible working with the blurring of boundaries, almost firms want more out of you. At the same time, 
We also haven't disrupted the norm about who's responsible for caregiving and housework, which means that, and flexible working enables women to do even more. So flexible working, by making work and family boundaries flexible, you're able to squeeze in a lot more. And this is especially women who had to be able, you know, had to really squeeze in every minute, every hour of the day to be able to carry out the amount of work that a male breadwinner used to do in 1950s and do double the amount of childcare that 1960s housewives did. So, and I, I, I don't remember any scientific discovery which has expanded the, you know, the, the working day to more than 20, a day to more than 24 hours. Our day hasn't expanded, whereas what we are able to do within a day has just expanded tremendously. And, and, and just to make things worse, women are then stigmatized when they are able to do all of this. Why? Because there is still a belief that, you know, flexible workings are, the workers are slacking off, that if you don't adhere to these kind of nine to five long hours work in the office, that you're not quite as motivated or committed as, as other workers. And you know, there are some scholars who said it's gonna be the men who face the double stigma because if you use flexible working, especially for care purposes, you not only deviate away from the ideal worker image, but you also deviate away from the masculine breadwinner image. So, oh, that they're gonna be stigmatized. I disagree and I've tried, you know, I, but also others have empirically proved this. And I, I write this very angrily in the book <laughs> where it's actually women, women get stigmatized. Why? Because that flexibility is bias is gonna be triggered against those whose work productivity and commitment are already questioned. So it's not gonna be men and it's not gonna be white men, white able-bodied men. It's gonna be mothers, it's gonna be ethnic minority workers, working class disabled LGBTQ workers who are already being questioned about their productivity and, and engagement that are gonna be facing that extra flexibility bias because that kind of, let's say suspicion is already there and flexible working will enhance or increase that. Uh, that. Um, and, and we have evidence of this in terms of the wage penalties as in terms of access as well. So in a way, not only like flexible working can be a great way to exploit women, but actually employees don't wanna give it to them because they don't trust women to use it in a way that would enhance uh, productivity, which again is, is, is based on, on wrong ideas. I'm just gonna talk very quickly about context. What I wanna say is this is not inevitable. What I just said is very American and UK based, but also some other countries or maybe Korea, but it's, like, it's, not necessarily, it's not necessarily the case in all countries. I don't know about the Netherlands, but what you do find is countries like Sweden and Denmark, that gendered flexibility paradox doesn't happen as much. So flexible working results in similar things for both men and women. The reason for it is because those are countries where gender egalitarian ideas exist and men and women do take part, not the same, but still have a bit more equal division of childcare and household labor. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the ideal worker culture, long hours work culture is not necessarily equal across the world. It is much more severe in countries like the US and UK. And those are the countries where these um, kind of paradox will more likely occur. And family policy shaped the way we think about flexible working as a normal right, which also changed. And, and again, workers bargaining positions. Um, and I'm just gonna skip that because I'm running out of time. And I want to kind of speak a little bit more about this last bit. Where do we go from here? So what can people do? So for governments, I think there needs to be stronger rights for flex. Again, you know, I'm not, and one, one thing is I, I'm a big supporter for flex working. I think it could be an amazing thing. It's just that we need to change the context around for it to be really used well. And we need things like stronger rights to flexible working, right to disconnect, um, changing working culture by maybe introducing four day week or shorter working weeks. We also need to introduce policies that shape our gender normative views about whose responsibility it is to care, which means drastically changing our maternity paternity leave so that it is both mothers and fathers who, who stay at home when the children are young to ensure that there, that normative uh, view changes. Um, yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna skip that. And then at the company level, you know, you need to change kind of how productivity 
commitment motivation is measured because you know we're still kind of base everything of like and opportunities are based on water cooler moments and and you know that it's still long hours like sitting in the office is still my uh, considered kind of motivation which is obviously not the case and I could talk a bit more about that if like uh, there's any question um I thought I might talk a little bit more about this individual and families I think one is one of the things I really wanted to um, say, like rest is so important. And I think writing this book, and I'm a, I'm a big kind of fan of Alex Pang's work, Rest, um, a book, Rest, which talks about why we need rest. And I think we as a society has, have come into this position of we are just doing so much and you know we're using flexible working to squeeze more and more in, into our lives. Uh, and, and also multitasking. And I kind of feel like, okay, just kind of on that productivity, uh, a perspective, having stricter boundaries and focused, concentrated time of work and focused, concentrated time of rest is much more efficient and, and efficient use of your time. Um, and of course, with heterosexual couples that you have to have these conversation about how flexible working is used and, you know, especially heterosexual men and, and, and couples with children, they need to start kind of like if they are afraid to use flexible working for care purposes, uh, too bad. They should because mothers already do it and there's no other choice. And yeah, mothers get penalty. And if fathers get penalty because they do it, I, I so be it. I think that's fine. I think, you know, let's let's everybody. Yeah. And then but that will slowly change uh, the ideas about what flexible working is, if especially heterosexual you know, white men take it up for care purposes and enable other people to 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 kind of in a way not be penalized. Um, <clears throat> I think joining a union is important. I might talk more if anyone has a question on that. But uh, most importantly, I, I want to share this with you. I don't know if if I could share it like, um, wait, wait, I'm just going to stop sharing and share something else. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> It's a. Uh, this is is a uh, nap ministry. <laughs> so there is a a group called the nap ministry. Oh, it's as a person, as as and obviously it's a black woman, of course it is. Um, do you believe that you know rest is a form of resistance as well as as, as a social justice issue? It's that the idea of that that we have kind of been too focused on the idea of you know. Um, of, of, you know, that, of, of being productive, et cetera. And that, as I talked about exploitation of women, but it, the same way there has been exploitation of ethnic minorities and other groups of workers by perpetuating the idea of productivity, passion and passion at work, et cetera. And what she's trying to say is, so we have to slow down and this is not, you being lazy, but you being actively engaged in social resistance to stop this cultural normative shift of having everybody hustling, everybody grinding themselves off to the point of, of you know, decline in well-being and, and burnout. And, you know, I just want everybody to just, I just wanted, to, I, I, I love, you know, highlighting and, and, and kind of celebrating, especially Black women's work. So I just wanted to kind of do that for a little bit before I come back to my final slide, um, <clears throat> which is, so the, what's the take home message? Again, I, I love flexible work. I think flexible working should be done by everyone, right? And short for working, but it's not a panacea. It's an amplifier in that it amplifies a lot of the problem of our work and gender culture. It's, a, it's an enabler. It's an equal opportunity provider but without the serious reflection and the dismantlement of our work, work-life balance, gender culture, and perhaps one of the things I forgot to mention is without really building better institution and protections for our workers, it is likely to result in unintended negative outcomes. And again, possibly more for the marginalized groups in our societies. And that is it. And this is our, uh, a discount code, which I will put up later as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hee Jung. Hee Jung. 
Um, I'm, oh, there's, you've given us so much to think about. Like there's so many things that are on my mind now. Um, but of course we have respondents, but if I can take two minutes, I'm thinking about the autobiography comment that you made, right? And how all of this, you know, very solid, uh, big scale research, how for many of us, of us, this resonates in terms of a feeling of autobiography. So I, I think that's amazing how you did that. The NAP ministry is <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for introducing us to that. That is amazing as well. Um, and it made me think, and that was the thing that I wanted to share. It made me think of something that has been said in the Netherlands this week by um, really the top administrators in the academic world. So, you know, the executive boards and then the organization that represents all the executive boards of all the universities. And that was in um, in a, in a a conversation, a conference kind of um, setting where um, one of the comments, one of the demands of people who want to change, you know, the system as it is now is that there would be more research money for everybody, right? So the idea of the big grants and all, you know, the energy of putting in the big grants, like what about getting more research money and distributing it to everybody? So everybody has more research money. And the very cynical answer that came from the president of um, or I don't know if it actually was him, but anyway, that that high up executive level of the the executive boards of the universities and um, uh, their organization is that if they were to do that, um, then it would not increase the productivity because people are already, it would probably mean that people who are working 80 hours a week now would go down to working 60 hours with that extra research money. So how would that increase overall productivity of all the research happening in the Netherlands? And so this is an argument that is just put out there in the public sphere and people are thinking about it. Yes, that wouldn't work, would it? And so when you think of that, you know, the resistance is indeed like, okay, we all have to stop doing less. But anyway, I am not a respondent. <laughs> I just had to put that in. And I am now giving the floor to first Stephanie. And also mentioning that people, if you already have comments or questions, you can write in the Q&A box. Okay, thanks a lot, Sarah. And thanks a lot, He Jung, for this fabulous book, this fabulous talk. I really enjoyed it enormously, um, reading your book. Um, I think um, it is we like really very comprehensive, um, very much you like um, combining different strands of research and theory in a very eloquent matter and combining it with really empirical evidence, which I found very impressive. And I also think it comes at a time which is so you know, like so pressing. I mean, with COVID, it basically opens up the whole discussion, and you, you know, everybody is now probably looking at you because thinking, where are we going with COVID now? And I mean, things what you also mentioned in a, in a way, you know, like um, in areas where it was not possible to work flexible, now it's possible. And of course, the question is, will it stay and what consequences will it have and for whom will it have the consequences? And in that respect, I think in your book, you show the gender dimension so clearly and you highlighted this in your talk so clear. And I'm absolutely on board with you that I think and I'm sorry to put it like this, but I really think the women are the losers in that debate. I mean, you know, like in, in a sense, it, I had discussions with, with also really, you know, like scholars who think that, yeah, part, especially part-time work, it enables women, it empowers women. It is something which is, you know, like put forward as something which is so important to keep women in the labor market, which I completely buy and see. But at the same time, I really think, uh, and you demonstrated this, this, this stigma about, you know, like anyhow, if you, what you, whatever you do, it will be not to your better part, you know, like you will be kind of stigmatized or anyhow punished in a way. And I think also what you very nicely showed is um, that the context matters, which is, I think also, I'm, I'm, I like comparisons. I think institutions are so important. Normative contexts are so important. And you also very eloquently showed this. As well as that, I mean, it's not all about the country context and the policies, but it's also about, you know, like the meso level, how firms are operating in this context. What kind of policies are they implementing? Of course, it's more complex because it's intertwined, but I think this is something you also very nicely um, show in, in your book. 
And now, you know, like reading your book, I came, of course, you, I mean, immediately thought, okay, now you have probably, you are the expert, you have all the answers. So you will give us some kind of, you know, no, it always comes. I mean, you will, you are perceived then as the expert and you are perceived as the one who probably also have thought, I mean, you are, as you said, you, you work on this so long, you, you have written the book, you have probably also worked a lot of hours on this, a lot of overtime, you know, like going into this. So um, in that sense, everybody expects, okay, and now you will solve it in a sense. Can we have a more gender equal society with flex work and so on? And so I read your solutions and your, your recommendations really with, with, with curiosity. And I think what you put forward is stimulating and inspiring, but at the same time, and here comes my very first question, is it radical enough? Is it radical enough in a sense of challenging what's going on there, what's, what's happening? Is it not just saying, okay, yes, of course, flexible work is nice and we need it and so on, but to be honest, and I mean, you started your talk with that. Is that not that we have to really seriously discuss what is the working norm? What is the normative? What you like? What is the ideal worker we are talking about? What is if I think about you know, like I mean, Phyllis Moon has. I mean, in two thousand eleven, she also has. I mean, it, it went a little bit more towards this career mystique, you know, like, and criticizing. Is it not that we have actually to think about also what you said? What is work? How do we define work? So why do we have to work 40 hours? Why, who, who came up with this norm? You know, like in a sense, why are we not really questioning the more fundamental and substantial aspects in our society? And of course, I mean, probably you have thought about it and it's also hard to put this, you know, like, um, yeah, put so, such a thing forward in a book, but this is my first question. So shouldn't we not go more and more aggressively in a direction in questioning really the norms on which we are basing what is work. And you said it as well, you know, like in a sense, paid work is not, not discussed. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of devalued. We have this, we, we see this. It's not in the, in, the, in the conception of, yeah, this is also hard work we are doing. And in that respect also, I mean, you know, like the whole discussion we have, flex work allows women to combine family and career or work. What not, where, where are the men in this picture? You know, where, where are the men in this whole discussion? And is not if we talk about gender equality that the discussion also have to shift to, yeah, how can we make this more? Yeah, so this is a little bit, don't we have to go a step further and really go to the substance? As a first question. I'm not sure, I'm allowed for the second question as well, because then I go for a second question because I think the second question is more related to Let's say we, we are able to, I mean, we talk a lot and, and also in your book, and I think this is also what I like because I had the same impression like Sarah, you, I connected immediately and I think you have a gift in writing. I really liked also this personal touch you give to the writing because you, you know, like it's, it's not just this high academic, you know, it's, it's a super nice combination. You come back and just get people into it. So I really, really loved it. But at the same time, I was thinking, okay, you give some advice for, the individual what you can do you also say a little bit in in your conclusion yes you know you have to talk to your partner but is it not more is it not that we have also to think about it's it's also about you know, like a family a family negotiates who works what and when and how yet it's also depending on who earns what and how can afford to have more flexible time and in that sense i'm wondering if you know, like the ideas you had of kind of um reducing gender equality in that aspect is it not also how can we reduce this imbalanced power relation in families and they are often women have less power than men and in the family and is that not also something which has to be addressed and how can we resolve this so this was a little bit where i was thinking yeah it's um it's not only about you as an individual who can decide but it's something which is in a family context and this is more complex and power relations are more complex in the family context. And with that, I stop and wait until <laughs> Tragana comes up with some questions, but I have some two more, but then I, I wait. But I think that's already a, lo a lot to engage with, right? <laughs> <laughs> but these were the pressing ones, you know? <laughs> yeah. Should I answer first? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Sure. First. Okay. First of all. Oh my God. Oh my God. Am I loving this so much? <laughs> like. Oh my God. Stephanie. And uh, before, I don't know if people saw this. Stephanie and I was like talking about like, oh, we could talk for half a day. And oh my God. Yes. With wine, please. Or you know, like something. Something strong. Um. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. This is not the 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 conclusion chapter, especially uh, wasn't was a bit of uh, it was a really just scraping through because well the book I had to lose fifteen thousand words um, because it was supposed to be much shorter than this. So it's actually it was longer than what uh, the publisher let me do, but I, I I managed to get a bit more in. But the conclusion had to be just completely cut off. And one of the things that I do think. I, I do felt like was the, you know, the conclusion of what needs to come out later has, has been really just like, just, just scraping the surface, but you're right. It has to be radical. And one of the things that I'm, I am talking about a lot and it does, it is in the book a little bit, but not enough. And I'm, I've, I've written a, a, a paper in the journal of social policy on it a bit more is about, we need to change the way we value work or like work, what work is or what value of work is because at the end of the day, like we have put so much and, and this has not even been the case all the time. It's just been most more recently, like the hustle culture and having, you know, exploiting yourself to the max is, is so like valued and 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 glorified. And this whole 80 hour work week, is, it's been glorified as something that is great. Why is that? Why we need to really radically shift that. And one of the ways there's, a, you know, we could do a number of things, but you know, through campaigns, et cetera. But I think one of the best ways of doing it is to make everybody work shorter hours so that our normal full-time hours should just be 30 hours a week. So rather than having, and this, I really like the point that you made about part-time work and flexible work and kind of enabling, you know, but as you say, and I think what, what you wanted to say is that what flexible working did is say, oh yes, you enabled women to take part in the labor market, great. But maintaining that power position that women will always be the second class citizen in the labor market. It is also effectively putting a structure in there so that women will never reach that position of first class citizens within that labor market structure. And that's what part-time work has done. And I'm, what I'm saying is that this will be something that flexible working, unfortunately, is going to be doing. Because what you'll see post-COVID, and I did write it in the book, I didn't present it, is that if you see men going back into the office and then, you know, kind of uh, rubbing shoulders with their managers and they're getting the promotion and great projects, whereas women are back in the house because they're doing childcare and et cetera. And, oh, yes, I need to be a better mom. I feel guilty for not spending more time with my family. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be left out. And that's, you already see that pattern and we're going to be seeing more of it unless you change it. And the four day week, the reason I want to do that is because first of all, I feel like that introduction of that will let us then really think about how performative long hours work is. Long hours work is not absolutely not necessarily at all. It's largely performative. And again, by certain individuals, mostly men, to show their masculinity. It is a part, it's a form of hegemonic masculinity. And it doesn't actually relate to performance outcomes, nor does it relate to uh, uh, outputs. And we have scientific evidence to show that maybe not necessarily like 30 hours, but you know, that it, it these long 70, 80 hours, definitely not in useful in any way. And so the four day week essentially, hopefully makes us think about, okay, what actually, what work are you actually doing? What is it, or are we, is this largely performative? And reflect back on how performative a lot of this actually is without providing any value and actually contributing to an incredible amount of social cost that we are bearing as a society through, again, the, the exclusion of women, as well as other, you know, marginalized groups, such as disabled workers, and also by, you know, uh, uh, like, like not only, you know, disrupting the well-being of, of individuals, but also of their families, their children, of our future. And, you know, also really by this kind of work central culture, we're really putting less value on a lot of really socially Im Im you know, important uh, behaviors, such as care work, as but also about, you know, environmental kind of sustainable kind of living, right? So this is why I'm like four day work. It, it, it's just a simple thing, but really four day work as a as a as a radical kind of reform of thinking about work and the value of work, and also the value of <coughs> a non non numerative work outside of of the market. And again, 
the reason why four day work week, again, I, I find it useful. And I, I say in the book that many to, many to work flexibly, many to work flexibly for care purposes, but also many to just work less, many to work less because there is a bit of a drive for especially younger generation men to want to do more, especially in childcare, et cetera. But they are unable to because of that performance and they feel like they're the breadwinners, they have to perform this long hours work. But also they're, they feel like as the breadwinner, they have they, they feel more consequential when they feel that kind of career stigma, which again, will put again, you know, women as, you know, the second class citizen and, and especially mothers as second class citizen in, in the labor market. But having said that being a bit more, as you say, kind of that, that imbalance of power, I, I think the imbalance of power really is, is there. And, and John Paul talks about it. it's, it's about money, isn't it? It's the amount of how much money are you being able to bring in, in within the family and the negotiation power that, uh, uh, comes with it. And yes, but in a way this, and then, and it's hard and I can't, and I've actually was talking to a woman who was like saying, yeah, like, oh, actually now, like having spoken to you, I realize how much of my career I've sacrificed and how much I'm kind of been kind of working around my partner's male partner's schedules, etc. But then it was kind of like, but then he earns more, like, what do I do? Like, and I think, it, it's hard because it's like, I think the, 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 the thing I would like to say is that, you know, if men, you know, men have to collectively start working less and working flexibly. And, but, you know, and, and you know what, I, 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 I just, just, you know, get penalized, but understanding like, you know, if you, if you, if you confront your boss and then work less or work flexibly, you know, it will help your partner earn more. And given the current labor market state, we're in, it's so much better for both of you to be, I mean, if you're going to be kind of looking at that in the market value perspective and productivity perspective, it's so much better for both of you to be engaging in the labor market. And, and it's, it's just, a, it's, it's just um, portfolio making, isn't it, to distribute the risks. And in a way for future, future um, labor market kind of potential, it is better for both of you to, to be able to take part which will reduce your responsibility of breadwinning, but also enhance your well-being as, as, as overall. Because another study I did using Time News data with the UK Time News survey shows that when men take part in childcare, they're happier. You're happier. You're well-being. You're less likely to be divorced. You're less likely to have quarrels with your, you know, your family. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine, Daniel Carson, shout out to Daniel. Like he talks about how couples who divide their their housework and and um, housework and childcare have better sex, you know, like, you know, it, like there's a whole range of reasons why they should. And even if yes, women don't have the negotiation power, I think it has to come with like, you know, like, or, or we have to persuade men or it has to come from within that there are really great positive aspects that they can gain rather than lose when, when they are actually behaving more like women, so to say. So what I'm I'm feeling that there's a follow-up plan happening or <laughs> kind of emerging of some like full brainstorming day on the future of work, right? That radical radical brainstorming on the future of work. Radical feminist uh, uh, brainstorming, and I, I yeah, and I think yeah, I, I, yes, we have, we to, have, to, do, we have to organize something. Now yeah. I would like to go to Dragana, and then we can come back to Stephanie. If I heard that you still have questions, but um, Dragana, you go. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Thank you. You can hear me well, right? Uh, thank you, Hee-Jung. Um, I have to say it's been a while that I uh, binged a book and I did that uh, yesterday and today with your book. <laughs> and uh, that was also while doing that, I was uh, thinking, oh my God, the, the neoliberalism and it felt like a bit like uh, driving a car and I was going to you know, have a, a crash. But uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And in uh, binging your book, I... Um, caught myself, um, I really enjoyed it, um, especially the, this like debunking nature of your book. And uh, I caught myself learning some things that I had actually assumed that are not true. And this is not something that you mentioned in your presentation, I think, but I didn't know that um, women dominated workplaces actually have the worst access to uh, uh, flexibility, uh, flexible schedules. So, uh, you know, and this goes on, on top of the already, uh, yeah, penalties for women-dominated occupations like uh, lower pay, 
Um, so this idea of compensating differentials, that is that, you know, we may get paid less, but they get other benefits is really uh, not true. And this is also something that uh, you also show in your book. But I really thought uh, women friendly, uh, lots of women, uh, more flexible uh, working. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to know that that's not the case, but also not surprising in a way. Um, one of the things that I thought about while reading your book was how this uh, trend in flexibility over time you sketch uh, also in terms of uh, well, government provision, like more legislation um, is um, related to or parallels um, developments in gender inequality over time. Um, and then I thought of this uh, literature on the stalled or the slowed gender revolution. Um, and then if we think more specifically about the, the gender pay gap, there's a, a couple of studies that um, show that um, in many countries, the, the narrowing of the pay gap has stalled or slowed down. Um, and that has been, you know, despite other developments like women overtaking men in education or increasing labor force participation that should have narrowed the gap. So there, there's something happening that is uh, offsetting these developments. And uh, I remember some work from, uh, you cited also in the book, um, Chan Whedon uh, in the US that is looking at uh, overwork. So um, trends in overwork over time related to gender or gender differences in overwork, but also uh, how the valuation of overwork over time by employers has uh, increased. And that also means more pay for individuals who uh, overwork also on the hours that are not overwork. And uh, these are, as we know, um, more often men. And so before I read your book, I thought there's overwork and there's this right, increasing valuation of overwork over time. That, and this study particularly finds that overwork is a, yeah, a big reason why um, the, there has been a stall in the narrowing of the gender pay gap um, over time. Um, so after I read your, your book, I also added uh, this uh, flexibility into the equation because you show that uh, flexible, like moving to like flexible schedules over time also in your longitudinal research uh, leads to more overwork. Uh, so I was wondering what your yeah thoughts were uh, on this issue more broadly. So um, if it's something that is you know directly related, or these are just parallel trends that we are seeing as a response, as a function of uh, yeah neoliberal developments uh, at the workplace. And uh, second question, I can be try to be brief. Is um, uh, uh, so a lot of your um, book talks about the the work family conflict, which uh, I understand is sort of like a dominant perspective in work um, family research. But I know that there's also this uh, work uh, family enrichment perspective, um, which is about how, uh, yeah, work and family are not necessarily uh, contradictory or conflicting. And that uh, there's a lot that we take like positive spillovers from our non-work lives onto work. Um, and I also thought at the same time about um, white feminism versus uh, <laughs> feminist books I've read by uh, by women of color, where they talk about, uh, you know, if we add race and class into the equation, we often conclude that the family is not such a bad place to be, especially if, you know, work is a terrible place to be and you have a yeah, exploitative employer. So, yeah, the question is how does this um where does this perspective like how does it look like in your work and uh um how it's also uh gender and slash class slash racialized its uh, implications thanks thanks so much for that that's really really important and, and you know again you know i, I it's um you, you know that, that, as i said like I wrote the book and it's based on how many years of research, whatever, but it's like, I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm like slowly understanding like the implications of it and also what needs to happen next. And, and just to take your first question, I think overwork over time or long hours working culture is one of the very major culprits of, of the stalled gender revolution. 
the reason is, is so with the rise of flexible working, but also, you know, like, especially as, as Stephanie said, part-time working, but also, you know, like child care provision, et cetera. We had done the first step, which is so mothers couldn't work. And now we are able to let mothers work or women with care responsibilities, maybe like informal care and other child care. But there's only 24 hours a day. <laughs> and it's impossible to fit what is a full-time lucrative job with childcare, even, you know, supported childcare by other means into a day for, for all workers. It's just, and who does that? So essentially it's like this. We have essentially maximized through flexible working and through other means, essentially maximized the number of hours women can do in the labor market thus far, but that doesn't, it does not compete with the male breadwinner who doesn't have any of that other responsibilities. And those are the jobs that are getting paid better and well. You talk, look at tech companies, you look at financial sectors. Goldman Sachs' CEO talks about how you have to work 100 hours a week. That doesn't leave anything other than literally defecating and eating like this and, and sleeping. That is like the, that is the amount of devotion you're, you're asked to do. And that's kind of similar in a lot of tech companies. Again, whether or not that is actually, you know, leads to productivity is another thing, but it's just a way in, and they are, they are compensated, you know, enormously for those, those devotion. Essentially, you know, long hours work, again, you know, if I can, and I, I like to give this example. So if you were to do a survey of UK workers and the eight hour day, how many of the, how many hours do you actually work? And it's about three hours. If you look at workers who say they, in the US uh, using time use survey, if you look at workers who say they work 70 plus hours a, a week, if you actually look at how many hours do they actually work, it's less than 50. Again, the, the thing is the long hours work is not necessarily something that you need to maintain a company or to, to produce outputs. It's just largely a performative measure, which is largely exclusionary. And I, I almost feel like the reason why they do it is to do that performance and exclusionary measures rather than it being anything related to actual output. And <clears throat> without changing that labor market, there's, there, there, we, can't, we can't have an equal labor market. There is gonna be a gender pay gap because majority of the well-paid jobs are in those sectors where you, you know, it could be surgeons, it could be again, you know, lawyers, you know, like those well-paid jobs are these very, very long hours work. And that's what Chad and Whedon shows, that's what Golden shows. And that, you, that results in, you know, gender pay gaps so that men are the ones who are able to do it. I mean, some women, obviously some women, and, but then in those heterosexual couple relationship, as Stephanie said, that negotiation power lies with who, much, who brings in more money. So it's going to be the women who then take a career hit. And then, you know, for the, the sustainability of the household finances, you take a step back and take on the second breadwinner role. And you're just happy being able to, to take part in the labor market without even thinking about achieving equality, but neither at home or in the labor market. Obviously, there are you know exceptions to the rules, but you know <coughs> that's just kind of the general pattern you see. Mostly, again, and you know, talk about class. That's that's a pattern that you see not across all kind uh, all, all couples, but mostly the upper you know middle class uh, higher occupation couples. Um, so, without again going back to that point of like really radically changing the labor market, radically changing the way we think about work and what working hours should look like, how work should be done, when work, where it should be done, and how much of it should be done, we can't really tackle this gender revolution issue, in my opinion. There is a limitation. Because the only other option we have is to say, you know what, okay, let's don't have kids, or put the kids, or, you know, like, or, or their well-being, or, or not just kids, but our pets, or families, everything, friends, just forget all that, we're all going to be working 80 hours a week. That's not the society we want to do. So, again, and, you know, as, as many, you know, uh, um, you know, previous, you know, feminists have said, we need to make Wake, make men more like women. So men need to step back. Men need to work less. Men need to take more part in the uh, in housework and childcare. Without it, we're not going to get anywhere. But again, you know, companies need to 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 wisen up. But and I I'm I'm very hopeful because I think the pandemic really made people realize how 
they, you know, work isn't all about, um, life isn't all just about work and it shouldn't be. And I know that, you know, there is a lot of insecurity and there is an increasing no amount of inequality in, in our society, but, you know, we need to make sure that these kind of, that pe people want to step back, people want to kind of enjoy life rather than just work. And also bit of, put a bit of a distance with work to say like, no, work shouldn't just be your passion and that's all you do. Like, that's just a part of like your life. And there's so many other aspects that you are, you know, that is important and meaningful. Um, uh, about the work family enrichment question, you're, and, and I, I did kind of mention it very briefly in the book that the irony is that, so people who work flexibly feel more work family conflict. So feel like work and family life is conflicting because you're doing too much of both, right? But at the same time, because you're able to do both, you're, 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 you're happier with the balance. So if you don't have flexible working, especially for women, what happens is you're either, you could only do the family or work, but not both because you can't really kind of split everything around in, 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 the, in this span of one day, especially when they overlap in terms of time and, you know, but if you are able to work flexibly and work from home and, you know, have flexi time, you're able to do more of it. So you're happier about the kind of the amount of work and, and family time you spend. Uh, um, that you were able to fit in, but you feel conflicted because you're trying, you know, you're always being pushed at both ends. And so there is a bit of a difference between that for family conflict and enrichment. And about classes, you know, and I think there is a difference as you write, like, you know, work was, you know, it's a very white feminist, but also just white middle-class uh, uh, perspective to think like, oh, work is really, you know, important. Having said that, and as I said, even all occupations, the idea of work as passion is being pushed. To the point, there was a BBC Four radio um, interview by a manager in a hospitality sector, so it was in a bar, and she was saying how, like, you know, you know, there's a certain like that they can't find workers, and they are trying to provide some higher income, although it's, it's ludicrously low, um, and and you know, work schedules are very kind of um, to shift is you only get to know your shifts a very few days in advance, etc. But it's like, oh, but we want people with passion, you know, with passion with, about what they do. So that kind of idea of passion is it's thread across everyone. They like, so although yes, there is variations, but the idea of that work needs to be meaningful and passion. You have to like, it, you know, you ask lower occupation groups, and even if they don't want to and they want to resist it, I think there is a bit of a social kind of slow trend towards everybody kind of needing to use the word passion and again because it's so much easier to exploit people if you have passion because if you're you know if you're passionate oh you don't need income because you do it for passion you know that stuff but yeah there is definitely class and race variation but um the class variation especially is about that whole gender thing about how the working class actually a lot of the under paradox doesn't happen because it doesn't work financially <laughs> so people will end up <clears throat> So men actually have to use their flex working to do some housework because they can't outsource it into it otherwise. And um, <coughs> so that it, oh, uh, women use flex working for, for, for care purposes more for, on, uh, lower, but it's like both men and women will have to use it for care and, and housework because they don't have other resources to kind of meet those demands. Yeah. I am also now looking at uh, the people in the audience, if we have questions there. Um, oh yeah, there's a question. Um, I think, Jung, that you can read along as well, right? But I will read it out so everybody can see or can hear. Without expecting the speaker to have the perfect solution, how can we move in this direction? I often feel defeated that the form of capitalism that depends, uh, demands high commitment and can reinforce gender norms will never be shifted and has so many complexities to try and work through the open political system. Um, when there is so much happening, war, climate change, just trying to get by and discussions of gender norms is still without universal acceptance. So I guess, I mean, this is a feeling that many of us share, right? Like the feeling of um, the complexity and of defeat, often feeling defeated. So it's once more the question that Stephanie started with, right? Like, how do we, how do we go from, from there? I think it's unfair. So, well, someone asked me, do you like the term workaholism, workaholism or workaholic? And I said, I hate it. 
the reason for it is not to say that I, I feel like, you know, there aren't workaholics, but it is putting the blame on the individual again, that somehow you are at fault for not fighting back against this kind of, you know, uh, increased competition and this hyper-capitalism mode in which that we are performing in. But I have to say, you know, it's not, it's not your fault. And perhaps one of the things about the NAP ministry, and, and the NAP ministry does say, it, but it's like, it's a time for collective action. You can't, can't this, uh, and, and in a way, you know, the Stephanie point about negotiation, it's like, it's very difficult for individuals to change because, you know, you, you're there for a reason. It's not like you were like lazy and, you know, you didn't do enough, that you are there because of the social structures there be. This is why I'm like a big proponent for the state national level changes in terms of four day weeks, in terms of, you know, providing well paired earmarked uh, uh, parental leave for fathers, earmarked for fathers, you know, um, and, you know, changes at the more national level. And of course, for the individual is to keep pushing back because it's very, you know, difficult for one individual to be like, you know what? I can't, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get into that hustle because, you know, it's with the exception of a very few privileged individuals, it's not up to you to be able to do that because you're going to lose out on it because the system is as such. Um, uh, I was going to say something, but I blacked out. <laughs> But yeah, so, and again, this is why I say, you know, please join the union because, and, and also, you know, you know, be politically engaged perhaps to be able to make, you know, find uh, parties and, and, and political leaders to be able to make those changes. Uh, yeah, oh, I had a really good point. Oh, but there's, thought... a, there's a follow-up question that actually will allow you, I think, to go more into that by uh, Ivan Gancio. Thanks a lot for such a wonderful presentation. If you wanted to give advice to labor unions or to lawmakers, what would your advice? What yeah, would your advice be about how to regulate and how to set the boundaries for flexible workers? For example, maybe they need to regulate that workers earn their wage based on specific goals instead of being paid per hour of work. Are you aware of these changes being introduced by managers with the intention of improving productivity, but also job satisfaction? So it, it becomes more concrete when we think of something like a union. What, what would the advice there be or law? Well, I mean, I think the most important thing is to make sure that if you do have like flexible working and because the problem is that it, it, it kind of makes everybody kind of deviate as individual contracts to so but some local unions in, in the UK have been really kind of um, creative in terms of providing collective kind of flexible working. So rather than having some people do flexible working or not, just to have a group, you know, collective flexible working so that you do not polarize individuals. So that's really important. And that, you know, within the worker group, that there's a clear understanding that we are doing it together. like to do or the country countries like to kind of introduce flexible working as an individual contract but no 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 like have it as a collective thing and make sure that you keep talking about it as a collective one and obviously that does oh the, the, the problem with I actually like the hour paid thing because the problem with project-based work is that you this 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 can lead to and this is a debate that's ongoing in Germany at the moment by the way uh with like um with the German uh uh, trade unions about whether or not you should go into a uh, uh, project-based work. So on one hand, it's good because it's like you're really providing workers based on the output rather than bums on seat. How many hours have the bums been on seat in front of the computer, for example, in, in, in the workplace? But the problem is if you do project work, you could slowly increase the amount of work that workers need to do. And a lot with the problem with the, the flexible working, a lot of the labor laws that are in place at the moment are completely useless because this whole boundary of what's constituted as work and non-work is, is not clear. So you we have these labor laws to not only protect workers, but also managers to ensure that they are using the workforce in an efficient and effective manner. And if you completely let go of this hours and boundaries of, of time, then you have a potential for potential exploitation, especially in countries where unions are not collectively bar, you know, organized and individuals are have very low negotiation power. So it, it, it's something that you need to kind of combine. One of the things I wanted to say was this actually about the long hours work and stuff. And um, 
and being so one of the things I think and academics and I, 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 I okay so I don't know if so and I say this more often than not and I kind of felt like everybody knew this but maybe I should say it so Sarah you talked about 80 hours work academics right first of all the amount of time you will share uh, save by academics not putting in a lot of time writing grants applications that are not successful given that grant application ERC is only about 10 percent success rate so that's like it takes about three months times how many academics. So this is a lot of wasted time on other people. Um, uh, but you know, so so first of all, that so they're in, they're 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 an idiot. I don't know who said it, but anyways. But I also want to do this. So one of the things you can do individually is this: is to make sure that people are aware of the fact that not everybody is following this long hours work culture. That's why I say I only work 37 hours a week, which for the Dutch, you're probably like, yeah, sure. Of course, that's what you do, you know, uh, because one of the things I think I appreciated most about living in the Netherlands as an IO and, and a postdoc was to see how effective and efficient people were working shorter hours and prioritizing, privileging, you know, sports, family time and time outside of work and how much that then improved your productivity. I'm not saying all work, you know, academics are like that in academia and in the Netherlands, but I think there are more of it compared to the, to the US and UK. And I don't think individuals can fight back the system as efficiently, but what we can do is share the stories of how it is possible. And also for those who do have that negotiation power and, and um, to, to uh, have that, that, that power to do so, to do less, to do less and actually support uh, early career researchers and not you know, fuel the <laughs> competitiveness of the, and, and do meaningful. And I think by, you know, one of the things I do wonder, going back to Sarah's point about academia is whether or not because of our competition, how much of unnecessarily stupid research we're carrying out and we're actually unable to do really deep, meaningful society changing work. I'm not saying, you know, people, we're all doing crap work, but you know, I wonder if we were given that space um, to do that, that we will actually be doing more meaningful. And I say this because if you, see a lot of especially natural scientists who have been making really groundbreaking research. And if you kind of talk you know, to them about their biographies, one of the key things that you need to do really deep mind, you know, societal changing groundbreaking research is the security and time, time to mess about, time to just be able to download if you want rather than you know produce 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 because when you're producing so quickly you don't get to step back and really see the big pictures and the big questions and don't think about talk about the big changes that we or big, big questions that we need to ask or we do it artificially so in a way we are doing a great um uh, um uh, you know, like we're not we're not doing science any favors by <laughs> making competitive research grants and asking people to work 80 hours to get them. Sorry, I, I wanted to just say that. <laughs> no, no, I think it's very important. And in that sense, it is about taking back time and space, right? And of course, the flexibility holds that promise that it's about taking back time and you show how complex it is, right? Like, no, it's not so easy, but, but it is that impulse of like taking back time and taking back space that has in a sense been colonized by these capitalist and with all the qualifiers right like racist patriarchal capitalist uh, modes of production um we're almost out of time speaking of time <laughs> um i just want to do a, a last check-in and there's no questions in the q a box at this moment i know stephanie still had some questions i don't know dragana if you still have something on mind okay let's then do a, a last round stephanie and dragana after each other and then the last word is for you yeah, it will be very brief um, because I think part of, of my questions you also addressed um, now in, in, in some of the answers of, of the audience. But I was just wondering in terms of, you know, you talk that you think it's very important to do something at the at the country, so at the state level, so that you know, like we have to change legislation, unionize, etc. 
But I think the firm is as well very important. And you also mentioned this. You mentioned this also in your book. But here I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, like the, I, the, the scenario you're developing is, let's say it's important that first we do something at the country level. Is that not also an incentive for employers just if they are able to move? Because, you know, like, I mean, if you say the, 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 the situation, I mean, of course, not every firm can move, but, um, you know, like, I think the incentive to, you know, like, say, okay, we, we just basically go out of any physical office and just do it, you know, like, we have a kind of company say somewhere where we can exploit people easily and we, you know, like, we do it then very flexible without any location and so on. I mean, there is also a risk if we don't get the employers on board and if employers not really... Yeah, implement this. And you have an idea in your book, but I'm also here wondering, is that realize, realizable in a sense that you say, again, we are in a globalized market, it's highly competitive. We have, you know, like firms have this idea about we have to be productive. And of course, I mean, they have to have workers who are super productive. So wondering about the four day week implementing this legally will also have impacts on the, on the employer and firms and yeah. How does that pay off in your scenarios? Yeah, Dragana, you can add on this. So my question is actually about COVID. So maybe I'm hesitant about asking it actually because we have so little time, but I could one, one sentence. So uh, yeah, so um, one of the chapters in the book is about COVID and sort of like the prospects of will this change things. And uh, one of the, things you talk about is that uh, since COVID you see that um, workers or like managers are really uh, much more uh, there has been sort of a decline in the flexibility stigma but if we think about it more skeptically I think you know isn't this really just a temporary thing because the baseline during COVID was very different so I guess employers thought you know it's either flexible working or no work at all um, so it's really a different baseline. So the comparison to before is not really, a, yeah, it can't be made directly. Yeah. Thank you. So very quickly, I, I think that I will just to dark on this question first. I think you're right. Um, so during COVID, because everybody was had to work flexibly, I think flexibility stigma was declined because it was a national regulation. It was a mandate. So there was no other choice. And I do see it coming back as well now. And it's really been because even the some of the you know the the the, the political leaders like such as Boris Johnson uh, talks about like working from home as people need to come back to work as if like people haven't been working from home you know or you know Goldman Sachs is like oh you or like Apple CEOs and these big names are like oh yeah it's not and that again hegemonic masculinity all over again really talking about flexible working as something that, you know, again, the idea of hegemonic masculinity is about, you know, upholding the male power. And it's like, they're just essentially replicating a lot of the things that were there before to ensure that, you know, masculine power and, and that kind of hegemonic masculine power uh, remains. Uh, and yes, so it is it is changing. So again, this is a time for workers and unions and, and everybody else to resist because it's, it's it isn't shifted so dramatically that will not go back, you know. About the four day weekend about productivity and flexible working and about so <clears throat> I think it's this, the only way to persuade um, so it's this Stephanie's question to persuade managers is to show them how by doing it, you are going to be more productive, you're going to be more efficient and you are actually going to be able to um, you know, uh, make more out of your workers. And I think it's, it's just that I think managers are also lazy and they're busy, they don't have the capacity. So they haven't thought about these things, but actually the very smart ones are already moving in that direction. Those who have the capacity to do so in big companies and such. So this is why, but then you might actually see a, a, like a discrepancy across, across company. And this is why I'm very much up for that national kind of debate or national move because some workers who are, uh, some companies who are smart, et cetera, will do it, but you need to really have a push. and. The thing is, as you say, for managers, it might not be an issue because you have a burnt out worker. Okay, bye bye. That's fine. The societal cost of it is such huge, so huge. And we are not letting these employers pay for those societal costs yet. And I think that national move, again, is to try to acknowledge not only the value of non-work has, 
on on society, but also how very bad work actually has on society. And to make sure that people who are causing those damage, such as you know the, the damage we do for the environment, you have to pay the cost. And I think increasingly we're doing that, that the damage that you, employers and companies are doing to human capital or human beings, we need to make them pay the costs really. And, and that's why we need kind of that national level, in addition to company level kind of push. I think that is a good note to end on, make sure to let them pay the costs as a way um, uh, to transform things, right? Like make, uh, make them feel uh, it in their pockets. Um, thank you so much. I think we all feel that we could go on. And so maybe we have to create other moments to make sure that we continue uh, these conversations. Thank you so much, uh, He Jung. Um, the everybody saw the flyer to get a discount on getting the book get the book <laughs> read the book make your libraries buy the book thank you so much stephanie and dragana um and i think and for everybody who was here with us uh, this uh, afternoon and in the spirit of what we said uh, make it a political point and a theoretically point of having a good weekend so enjoy the weekend make sure it's a weekend and um, we see each other again next time bye everybody thank you thanks a lot bye